Hello friends, my name is JJ. So here's a story that I've heard about a billion times and I bet you have too. Some young kid is poking around his dad's office, which is full of junk. He notices an old floppy disk and picks it up, delighted. Look, he exclaims, somebody made a 3D printed model of the save icon. I don't care how many people claim that they've actually heard a kid say this. This is obviously an apocryphal story that exists mostly to highlight the speed of technological change these days. But taken more literally, it is also an interesting illustration of the concept we will be talking about today, which is visual anachronisms. A visual anachronism occurs whenever an illustration or symbol of something is woefully out of date. It is an inaccurate depiction of what a thing actually looks like in the modern world and yet we still understand what it is supposed to be because somehow or another, we've learned to read these old fashioned symbols with modern eyes. Outdated graphics on computer interfaces like the save button tend to be the visual anachronisms that we are most familiar with today. On my iPhone, for instance, I make calls by clicking on a button with a stylized depiction of a rotary phone receiver, a contraption I haven't actually used or even seen in at least 20 years. I send electronic mail by clicking on a depiction of a snail mail paper envelope, and I adjust my settings by clicking on this little silver gear, even though as far as I know, my phone is not actually powered by clockwork. Why do we rely so heavily on such hopelessly outdated symbols? Well, the communication scholars have a few theories. One is the idea that man requires visual archetypes to ground his understanding of objects whose designs in the real world are otherwise intimidatingly fast changing. This gets into the deeper theory of symbols or semiotics, which argues that the effectiveness of a symbol is ultimately born from the creation of a relationship with the observer and that this relationship matters more than things like a strictly accurate physical representation. So when we talk about an archetype, we are talking about the creation of a relationship in which the observer just learns to accept some arbitrary depiction of a thing as that thing's standard form. So like this will forever be the standard form of a phone, regardless of what phones in our real world actually look like. It would be too impractical for our symbol for phone to keep constantly changing in perfect sync with technology. So as a culture, we just agreed at some point that this will be our phone archetype forever. Another semiotic theory that's a bit more condescending is the idea of skeuomorphism. Skeuomorphism is a pretentious term that basically describes the idea that people will struggle to embrace new objects or technologies that do not in some way physically resemble the things that came before. So for instance, at one time it was common for digital painting programs to try to recreate the sensation of drawing on an actual piece of paper as much as possible. They had cursors that looked like little brushes and icons that were detailed pictures of art supplies. As time went on, those icons slowly got more stylized and proponents of skeuomorphism generally hold that you have to start representational before you can get abstract. Though sometimes it does seem that the evolution just gets stuck in a kind of awkward middle phase. If you've seen those memes where they show the decay of a representation using pretentious semiotic theory. This is basically the idea of the second to last phase in the decay of a symbol. The phase that makes you question your sanity before the symbol basically stops trying. Take the paint bucket tool in Photoshop, for instance. I'm not sure that this collection of pixels really works as either a pure abstraction or a stylized representation. It's just a kind of weird in-between thing that makes you question exactly what it's trying to do. So a few weeks ago, I made a video about the symbols used to depict toys in mainstream American culture and how these symbols, you know, the classic toy soldier or train or drum, are sentimental anachronisms that originated from British Christmas culture in the mid 19th century. And in response to that video, you guys offered up a ton of fascinating examples of other visual anachronisms that dominate our daily lives. So I thought I would spend the remainder of this video discussing some of them. One example that immediately grabbed my attention came from my friend R.C. Sammy, who said, For camping symbols, they show triangular tents, 1950s style camping trailers, and old wooden canoes. Even though tents are more often round, and kayaking is more popular than canoeing. My friend Inventor Zahran added, What a boot, the typical symbol of an unprotected campfire, despite the fact that almost all campfires are now burned in stone or concrete pits. I found these examples interesting, 
because while they obviously fit into the archetypal model of symbols, some semiotics people would say that our camping symbols could also be understood as mythological symbols too, which is to say a symbol that evokes a romantic ideal form as much as an arbitrary archetype. These days, we often go camping to get away from the modern world, so you could say that camping symbols are more effective to the degree they are able to evoke this spirit of old-fashioned things like a wooden canoe or an unprotected campfire. It is similar to what we saw with the toys, where our habit of depicting Christmas toys in an old-fashioned way is part of our culture's larger fascination with the romantic idea of a wholesome and traditional Victorian-style Christmas. Here is another good example of a kind of romantic, sentimental anachronism from my friend Jesse J, who says, one of those symbols that's just kind of here to stay is the pearl necklace. It's such a symbol of jewelry slash beauty slash femininity, even though I haven't seen one on a person in a while. And I agree, it is certainly very hard to imagine a cartoon of a stereotypically glamorous lady and having her wearing anything but a pearl necklace. It is also hard to imagine her wearing anything but a dress, which brings us to one of the most ubiquitous visual anachronisms of our time, the little woman symbol on the bathroom door. If you were an alien who came down from Mars and were given this, as your only guide to distinguish human males from females, it wouldn't be much use, given that the vast majority of women, at least in the West, don't wear big, wide dresses anymore. Considering the gender sensibilities of our time, it is even a rather condescending and politically incorrect depiction. But it is also a case study in how anachronisms sometimes have to be used simply for reasons of convenience, and they aren't necessarily intended to convey any values or political messages. But other times, the exact opposite is true. Consider another piece of clothing, the top hat. Like the pearl necklace, the top hat is associated with a certain vibe of aristocratic glamour, even though it is an extremely obscure fashion accessory in the modern world. Even in Great Britain, a country known to embrace aristocratic traditions more than most, I believe they only have one specially designated day a year, the Royal Ascot, where it is considered appropriate for upper-class men to actually wear top hats. Yet, I have noticed that in left-wing political cartoons, you see top hats and even monocles worn all the time as a symbol of the wealth and extravagance of the capitalist class. This would be another example of an anachronism that evokes a sort of myth. In this case, the famously sinister plutocrats of the Victorian age, who did wear top hats and we now think of as being uniquely corrupt and decadent. So drawing plutocrats wearing top hats in the 21st century is a way that the artist tells the reader that they see these two discrete generations of rich guys as one and the same. There's also a whole other level of hostility in the anachronism that comes from the fact that most of today's uber-rich capitalists don't actually like dressing in an ostentatiously wealthy or elitist way. So a cartoonist who depicts them all in top hats and monocles is purposely ignoring the way that today's rich people use unique symbols of their own to build their own preferred image of themselves, such as by wearing unpretentious clothes. And speaking of anti-capitalist politics, a number of you cited the hammer and sickle as a good example of a visual anachronism too. This symbol, the symbol of communism, is probably the oldest political symbol still in use today, and it is so familiar that most of us have probably never stopped to think about what it is literally supposed to be. Back in the early 20th century, when it first started being used, the hammer and sickle was designed to symbolize the glorious coming together of the working classes to crush the capitalists, as embodied by two distinct symbols of labor, the hammer, which was a tool associated with men building things in factories, and the sickle, which at the time was a tool associated with harvesting wheat on Russian farms. So industrial labor meets agricultural labor. However, given that much of the world, including Russia itself, now has an economy that is mostly post-agricultural and post-industrial, the hammer and sickle has faced growing criticism for being dated, with this in turn implying that communism is a dated philosophy. I see that the French Communist Party actually ditched the symbol in 2013 for this very reason. It doesn't illustrate the reality of who we are today, said the party boss. It isn't so relevant to a new generation of communists. 
artists. A similar example I've always liked is the coat of arms of Italy, which doesn't look much like you probably expect. When the Italian monarchy was abolished in 1947, their constitution was rewritten to proclaim the country a democratic republic founded on labor, and the coat of arms was accordingly changed to this, the centerpiece of which is a giant gear, because that was a common symbol of labor in those days. Today, of course, the number of Italian workers who interact with gears has gotten pretty small, making the coat of arms something that a lot of modern Italians are pretty indifferent to, and a good example of the ways in which anachronism isn't always value neutral. Now my friend Nilpunt has a great example of how anachronistic symbols often feed off anachronistic language. If you look for an icon of car keys and just the fact that they're so commonly referred to in the plural, you'll often get two simple stamped metal keys on a ring, harkening back to the days when you had one key for the ignition and a different one for the door and trunk locks. This example brought to mind the way that we talk about moving visual data around on the computer. You know, cut and pasting. And how we so often have a scissors icon to represent the cutting, and an anachronistic wooden clipboard to represent the pasting. Though I am old enough to remember when an old-fashioned paste jar was sometimes used for the latter. Even now, you sometimes see a paste jar represented in clip art depictions of back-to-school supplies. I guess because the start of the school year is very sentimentalized in American culture, and as we've seen, sentimentality tends to correlate highly with visual anachronisms. But getting back to language, a lot of you guys pointed out how so much of our symbology associated with making audio or video recordings is tied up in anachronisms. Even in this digital age, we are so often talking about filming or taping things. And our whole iconography around cameras and audio recorders still often feature stylized representations of machines using physical tapes or film. But one example I thought was really interesting came from my friend Metrolin, who brought up something I'd never really thought about before. Audio software using a red circle to indicate recording comes from old physical media recorders, which would flash a red light when ready to write. This one is actually super meta and self-referential when you think about it. Machines have traditionally shown a red light when making a recording. This then made a red circle a common symbol to use on the record button on the VCR or whatever. And now, when I go to make a recording on QuickTime, I press a red circle representing a stylized representation of that stylized representation. So basically, the takeaway I want you guys to get from all of this is that symbols are complex things, and that even symbols we can group together in a common category, like visual anachronisms, will often work in vastly different ways and survive for vastly different reasons. Sometimes it's about convenience, sometimes it's about politics, sometimes it's sentimentality, and sometimes there's no real defense, they're just kind of awkward and out of date. But in any case, talking about symbols is a lot of fun, and I would be curious if you guys have any other ideas for symbology-themed videos you'd like to see me make in the future. Let me know in the comments, and I will see you all next week.